Good morning. Ten thousand years ago, Boston Harbor was dry land, and we were here. One thousand years ago, much is much of what is now known as the city of Boston was underwater, and we were here. 400 years ago, English colonists came to occupy our land, and we were here. Today, most of greater Boston is a major urban area occupied by others, and still, we are here. We are the Massachusetts. So we are gathered today in native space. We are gathered in native space and on the traditional lands of the Massachusetts nation. We remember those who came before us and we prepare for those who will come after us. Here is where our ancestors laughed, cried, loved, made music, practiced our belief, shared both food and knowledge and made both useful and sacred things. Here is where we raised our children and buried our dead. Here is where we continue to live, holding the land and traditions of our ancestors, and here is where our children's children will continue after us. My name is Elizabeth Solomon, and I am a member of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. When indigenous communities in the United States gather together, they traditionally acknowledge and honor the ancestral holders of the land they are meeting on. Many non-Native communities have begun to incorporate this practice in public events, both to honor the Native peoples who belong to the land and to recognize that the use of the land by others has come as a result of displacement of the land's original holder. I'm here today because the Harvard Chan Dean's Office has taken the important step of incorporating this acknowledgement of Native lands and peoples within this convocation activity. I sincerely thank the school's leadership for, it, for its leadership on this. <laughs> Many people find it hard to imagine an urban environment as native space. But our connection to this space has not been affected despite thousands of years of both natural and man-made changes to our environment. Our environment is once again undergoing significant alteration, and still, we will be here. We belong to this place, and no alterations to the land, the climate, or those who live among us can change this. But what do I mean by native space? You may imagine the sites of fame, former native settlements or places that have some historical significance, but know that our sense of space and place are not limited by perceived boundaries of time, habitation, or ownership. We are part of this place just as the land, the water, and the sky are part of this place. We are part of this place just as the plants and animals are part of this place. We are part of this place just as the wind and the rain are part of this place. And just as these elements are not separable from this place, Neither are the Massachusetts people. We do not live in this place. We are of this place. I mentioned earlier the protocol of acknowledging native lands and people and the move to incorporate them within the public sphere. But I challenge non-native peoples and institutions to go beyond verbal land acknowledgement and to consider what it might really mean to honor native space. Honoring native space means acknowledging that even your breathing has an effect well beyond your body and your individual lives. It means understanding that everything you do necessarily resonates throughout the larger environment. It means considering every action with its broad consequences in mind. It means living as if other lives are dependent upon your actions, because they are. It means acknowledging that wherever you are in the Americas, that you are in native space. It means understanding that the indigenous people who belong to that place have ancient and inseparable connections to it. It means the people that belong to that place are your host, 
and that they should be treated as such. It means honoring their customs and treating their lands with respect. And crucially, it means realizing that all individuals, regardless of where we are from or where we belong, are in reality only short-term visitors. And because we have a unique ability to make drastic changes in our world, we also hold the responsible responsibility to consider that, it, to consider the world and all that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here to welcome you all to be part of this amazing celebration of our Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health graduates and family. To our distinguished faculty and staff, thank you for your tireless work to make today possible. To the families and friends who've joined us from all over the world, I say thank you. Thank you for your sacrifices, the sacrifices that you've made to be here, and for all of the love and support that you've offered our graduates. No one gets here alone. This day is yours too, and you deserve, as family members and friends and supporters, you deserve your own round of applause. Thank you. And to our Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health Class of 2019, congratulations, you've made it. It's hard to not stand here and beam with pride, the pride of looking out at all of you. This is a class of distinction on so many levels. Altogether, 606 of you are receiving degrees. You've come from all over the globe, from 55 countries and 37 states in the US, plus the District of Columbia. And importantly, 365 women will walk across this stage to receive their diplomas. That fact, that fact holds a special significance today. It is a testament to how far we've come as a university, as a school, as a field of public health, and as a society. After all, just think about this. It was exactly a hundred years ago this spring that Alice Hamilton, a renowned industrial health expert, was named assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. She was the first female faculty member in university history. At the time, Harvard didn't even admit female students. The New York Tribune lauded the occasion of Dr. Alice Hamilton's appointment with a headline that read, and I quote, a woman on Harvard's faculty the last citadel has fallen. The sex has come into its own. Yes, Alice Hamilton's appointment was an extraordinary milestone, but it came with a fair share of skeptics and more than a few restrictions. Let me share some with you. For starters, Alice was barred from the male-only faculty club. She couldn't even get tickets to the Harvard football games. And she was asked not to embarrass the university by taking part in academic ceremonies such as this one. Now you might ask yourself, what would possess Hamilton to pursue a career in which she'd encounter such disregard, even disdain as a woman? 
In her autobiography, Alice humbly explained, and here I quote, I chose medicine not because I was scientifically minded, for I was deeply ignorant of science. I chose to become a doctor because as a doctor, I could go anywhere I pleased, to far off lands or city slums, and be quite sure that I could be of use anywhere. And so go anywhere she did, even when it raised eyebrows, even when it was uncomfortable. As a young woman, Alice moved into Hull House, a settlement in working class immigrant families in the neglected 19th Ward of Chicago. She wanted to understand the daily reality of the living poor, of their working conditions, and the poverty that they faced, and to put her medical training to use however and wherever she could. While living there in Hull House, she opened the settlement's first well clinic for infants and young children. She searched far and wide the surrounding neighborhoods, investigating the root cause of typhoid fever and tuberculosis diseases that plagued the community, and she educated mothers about prevention. Hamilton's years at Hull House were formative. Life in a settlement does several things to you, she would later say. Among others, it teaches you that education and culture have little to do with real wisdom, the wisdom that comes from life experiences. That realization that you have to truly understand the lived experience of other people in order to make a difference in their lives becomes our North Star. It was her North Star that guided her remarkable career. Long before Alice came to Harvard, she spent decades researching industrial health on the ground, observing workers that she would call workers in dangerous trades. These trades included the lead and enamel ware industries, rubber production, and explosive manufacturing, just to name a few. She went down into the mines, she visited hospital wards, and she talked her way onto factory floors, all to better understand the hazards of these jobs. In the process, Alice became a leading authority on industrial diseases. But Alice Hamilton was not content in merely proving that these occupational dangers existed. She didn't stop at collecting field notes, analyzing data, or writing up reports. Instead, she used those findings to sound the alarm to fight for the much needed safety standards. It really is impossible to overstate the impact Alice Hamilton had on the nascent field of occupational health and the well being of industrial workers across the country. Her research, her advocacy helped shape scores of state and federal policies, including the landmark Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, which, by the way, was signed into law just three months after she died at the age of 101 years. A century after Alice Hamilton first set foot on this campus, the influence of Alice's work still ripples across our community. Today, the Education and Resource Center for Occupational Health and Safety is training the next generation of leaders to address the health risks facing the modern workforce. And I can't help but think about how proud Alice would have been of our own Dr. Diana Sabalis, who is investigating hazardous exposure in a variety of industries, particularly those that employ vulnerable populations. Dr. Sabellis teaches a class called
called Introduction to the Work of the Environment. Introduction to the Work Environment. And her students aren't just learning about occupational hazards, they're spreading their knowledge, democratizing their knowledge in the most effective way possible using that wonderful tool that we now call Wikipedia. I remember I used to tell my son that Wikipedia was not in and of itself sufficient source for research. I have since changed my tune, and that is because so many of us have had the opportunity to improve the text and the evidence that is on that platform. So, the group that has been working with Dr. Sabalis has found their way to use technology to contribute evidence, evidence-based factual content on risks in a wide range of workplace settings from electronic waste processing facilities all the way to the work that it, people are exposed to in the U.S. Air Force. That's taking knowledge and putting out into space where it can make a positive impact on the lives of workers. But I would say that Alice Hamilton's greatest contribution was the doors that she pried open and the example that she set for all of those who would follow her. Graduate students like your own Jasmine Hall, who today <laughs> Jasmine has a big fan club. Jasmine Hall, who today receives a master's in public health in neuropsychiatric epidemiology. Jasmine grew up in Flint, Michigan, in a neighborhood that lacked necessities like fresh, healthy food and green spaces. Her community was recently traumatized further by the water crisis. Jasmine plans to take her Harvard training and return home to Flint with degrees in hand to study the socio-demographic, genetic, and environmental influences that affect mental and neurological health and to better the well-being of her community. Alice would be proud, Jasmine. <laughs> and, and, and think about other graduates like Angel Rosario, Angel was recognized as a gifted and talented student at a very young age, which helped him land a spot at an accelerated middle school on the Upper West Side, a world, a world far away from his home in Harlem. Angel saw the vast disparities rooted in race, poverty, homophobia, and language differences firsthand. And now his goal with an Harvard Chan School education is to help eliminate those disparities by working to make the U.S. and the global health systems more equitable and more just. We also, <laughs> we also see Hamilton's influence reflected in the ordinary women who are leading our field today the improving health and well-being across all of our communities. Women like our very special guest, Cecile Richard, who has helped, <laughs> yes. Cecile Richard, who has helped expand healthcare to millions of American women, particularly those in rural and underserved communities. We are so delighted to have Ms. Richards here with us today. We're also inspired by women like Kate Nordahl, a beloved member of the Harvard Chan School family who tragically passed away last April. At Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Foundation, Kate served as the senior director of coverage and oversaw Massachusetts Medicaid Policy Institute. She also directed the foundation's Massachusetts Health Reform Survey, tracking trends in healthcare access and affordability. So many of us have been touched by Kate's life, by her passion for helping people, her dedication for improving healthcare across the Commonwealth. 
Alice Hamilton's spirit endures in today's generation of public health visionaries in a profound way. She fundamentally changed the way we think about our mission. She impressed us, she impressed upon us that public health is more than academics, it is about activism. And that is the lesson that I hope each of you will take with you as you make your way back out into the world. Because today we know that our health doesn't just affect every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our lives affects our health. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the foods we consume, our access to vaccines and preventive care, how much we exercise, and our proximity to green spaces, the strength of our social connections, the quality of our schools, and the safety of our workplaces and homes, our economic security, whether we suffer discrimination, emotional trauma, or violence. And these factors shape the quality of our lives and the health of our communities. And we know that large scale change, large scale change in the environments we live, the behaviors we practice, the policies that shape our everyday realities will not happen on its own. So it's up to us, it's up to us to make sure that our work is not confined to laboratories or research clinics, that our discoveries don't languish in white papers or journals. It's up to us to see that we learn to not only change hearts and minds, but that we also contributing to changing outcomes. I encourage each of you to think about your role in public health through that lens. Whether you stay in academia or go into government or join the nonprofit or private sectors, remember that public health requires, encumbers a responsibility for taking action. No matter where you've headed, today you leave here with a diploma and a knowledge base that will take you far. You have an amazing foundation that will help you think critically and find solutions to even our most vexing complex problem. I hope that you'll remember what you got into this work, why you got into this work in the first place, and what you seek to accomplish. Remember the problems you felt compelled to solve and the lives you felt called to improve. And I hope you'll venture out of the hollowed halls of institutions like this one. I hope that you will break out of your comfort zone, that you will immerse yourself in new environments as Alice had, that you will get your hands dirty, that you will talk directly with the people you wish to serve, and most importantly, that you listen, that you listen to them, that you see them, to get to know their lives and their needs intimately. That will allow you to observe things you have never would have seen from afar, to understand things you never could from a distance. That's how you go from being an academic to an academic advocate. Only then will you truly realize the power you hold to make change. And in the end, that is what each of us is called to this field to do, to make change. Decades after Alice Hamilton first set foot on this campus, and long after she retired, she looked back on her extraordinary life, on all the places that she traveled, and the body of work that she had contributed to, and she had this to say, for me, the satisfaction is that things are better now and I had some part in it. Each of you started your own journey in public health because you dared to envision a healthier world, a more just world. 
I'm so proud of you reaching this first milestone in that pursuit and for the ways in which I know each of you, each of you too will have a profound part in realizing that vision. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to serve as your dean and to take this journey with you. Thank you to the class of 2019 and congratulations. So it's my great pleasure to now introduce our student speaker this afternoon, Eric Mooring. Before I invite Eric to step up to the podium, I'd like to tell you a little about this accomplished young scholar. He has a fascinating and wide-ranging background. Today, Eric is receiving a Doctor of Science degree in epidemiology. For his doctoral research, he studied the spatial epidemiology of infectious diseases, focusing on tuberculosis and a neglected tropical disease called Yaws. Look that up on Wikipedia. <laughs> in fact, Eric served as an advisor to the World Health Organization on Yaws Eradication Strategy. Look that up again. <laughs> Last year, Eric earned a Master's of Science degree in biostatistics here at the school. And before that, he completed a Master of Philosophy in Veterinary Science at Churchill Scholar at the University of Cambridge in England. Eric grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska and received his bachelor degree, summa cum laude, from Georgetown University with a double major in environmental biology and government. Outside of his academic work, Eric serves the Harvard community as an emergency medical technician. This summer, Eric will take up a position as an EIS officer that is an epidemic intelligence service officer with the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And for the next two years, Eric will be based in Anchorage, Alaska. Please join me in welcoming today's exquisite student speaker, Eric Mooring. Greetings to Dean Williams, distinguished guests, faculty, staff, and alumni. Congratulations to the class of 2019 and to our parents, friends, and loved ones without whom we would not have reached this day. Last year, I participated in a winter session field course in Fortaleza, Brazil, during which, <laughs> during which we visited a community health and social development center named Quatro Varas, located in a poor neighborhood just steps from the Atlantic Ocean. The center's founder, Dr. Adalberto Barreto, told us that Quatro Varas means four six. He then told us a legend about an elderly man who, nearing the end of his life, gathered his four sons together. He asked each one to pick up a stick and then showed that he could easily break each stick. But when all four sticks were bound together, they could not be broken. He had few material resources he could leave his sons, but he gave them a vital lesson. If they stuck together through life's challenges, they would never be broken. In a sense, this is also the story of our school and of the field of public health. Our health is shaped by many factors, from the genes inside each one of us to the powerful, systemic, social, political, and economic forces that shape the worlds we live in. 
As a result, we need to draw on insights from a vast array of disciplines. As an epidemiologist, I need molecular biologists and social and behavioral scientists to help me identify what exposures are important and how they relate to each other. I need to work with experts at implementing health programs to determine what research questions most need to be answered in order to improve interventions. No one person can be an expert in all areas. We need each other. There is also another sense in which Quattro Varas should guide our life in public health. From its founding, it has worked from the premise that all people and all communities have strengths. At its core, Quattro Varas is a space where people can contribute their own knowledge and collaboratively find their way to solve community problems. In public health, there is a risk that we see communities facing heavy burdens as solely that, communities with problems. But we'll never find a community's strengths if we assume there aren't any. To maximize our effectiveness, we must partner with the people we hope to serve. From a Fortaleza favela struggling to overcome cycles of youth violence, to a village along the Congo River facing an Ebola outbreak, to a town in rural Indiana struck by a dual crisis of opioids and HIV. Outside experts trying to help such communities will fail unless they earn the trust of community members. And earning trust is hard, especially in a world where there's a long-running trend of declining trust in nearly all institutions. But there is a path forward. Dr. Adalberto emphasized that humility is the key to working together across disciplines and ideological perspectives. Humility doesn't mean abandoning what we know, but it does mean acknowledging the limits of our own knowledge and our own perspective. We have become experts on many topics, but let's never forget that people are experts on their own lives, their own communities, and their own values and priorities. I hope that wherever life after Harvard takes us, will not only carry with us everything we have learned here, but also an abiding realization that there's so much more we do not know. With this perspective, we will be able to pick up the sticks each of us contributes and bind them to those contributed by our fellow citizens living in communities near and far. Working together with each other and with the public we will advance the public's health far more than we could do alone. Thank you, and Godspeed. Thank you, Eric. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's convocation speaker, Cecile Richards a dedicated organizer and an outspoken visionary in the field of sexual and reproductive health care. Cecile is an expert at making good trouble. She has devoted her life to providing, protecting, and expanding health care for communities in our country that might otherwise go without. And today, she's giving women the resources they need to channel their political energy and move issues like reproductive health from the margins to the mainstream. I can think of no better suited person for guiding our next generation of leaders. At the helm of Planned Parenthood for 12 years, Cecile grew the 102-year-old organization's supporter base from 3 million to 12 million. She helped, she helped to secure no-cost birth control for 72 million people 
under the Affordable Care Act. And she turned the Planned Parenthood website into the foremost source of inclusive, evidence-based sex education in the country. <laughs> Cecile has always fought not just for Planned Parenthood's 2.4 million patients per year, but also as an advocate for improving health care access for women, immigrants, LBGTQ, and underserved communities everywhere. She is the embodiment of Planned Parenthood's mission to care no matter what. In everything she's done, Cecile has always led with the conviction that public health is a public good. Over 600 healthcare centers and a presence in all 50 states, Planned Parenthood is the number one provider of sexual and reproductive health care in this country. One in five women in America have been to a Planned Parenthood health center. Today, we are at a 30-year low in unintended pregnancy and a historic low for teenage pregnancy in America. Thanks in no small measure to Cecile's leadership and her status as one of the public health community's most effective ambassadors. Whether she's refuting misinformation on cable television or testifying before Congress, Cecile is always the first to point out that the number of women who graduated from college today is five times what it was before birth control was legal. That the pill is responsible for a third of women's wage increases since the 1960s. And that women now make up more than half of graduate school students like the ones we are celebrating here today. As vital as her voice is in the field of public health, Cecile's advocacy and the movement building work that she does long predates her time at Planned Parenthood. At the age of 16, Cecile helped her mother, the first female governor of Texas, Ann Richards, campaign for Sarah Waddington, the attorney who won Roe v. Wade in her bid for the Texas state legislature. After her earning her undergraduate degree from Brown University, Cecile led organizing efforts for workers in hotel, healthcare, and janitorial industries throughout California, Louisiana, and Texas. That was just the beginning. She's gone on to launch nonprofits dedicated to maximizing voter participation, promoting progressive issues, and countering the efforts of anti-abortion politicians to limit the rights to safe, legal abortion, and the full spectrum of reproductive health care. Since leaving Planned Parenthood, Cecile has focused on helping elect candidates who support abortion rights and access to health care, particularly women candidates. And just this month, she launched Super Majority an organization dedicated to harnessing the political power of women writ large. Women are not a special interest group. They are the majority of Americans. In fact, <laughs> and that is a fact, and supermajority is committed to making sure we never forget that fact. I could go on and on, but frankly, Cecile's incredible career is documented with warmth and humor in her book, the New York Times bestseller, Make Trouble, Standing Up, Speaking Out, and Finding the Courage to Lead. It's more than a memoir. 
It's a field manual. It's a field manual for any and everyone fighting for the notion that health care is a fundamental human right. I implore you, read this book, graduates, friends, and family members of graduates. Read this book. It is a joy to read, and it is a testament as much as a field manual for making trouble along the lines of our dear Alice Hamilton, to make trouble, to do good for everyone, everywhere. Cecile, thank you. Thank you for your activism, for your steadfast support for women's rights, and for your commitment to public health as a bedrock for a healthy society. Ours is so much stronger and healthier because of everything you've done. So with that, it gives me great honor to welcome Cecile Richards to the podium. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dean Williams. Thank you to the faculty and the staff and beaming family members and partners and friends. Uh, thanks for in, uh, inviting me to share this enormously joyful occasion with you. Um, and to Eric and Jasmine and Angel and the 365 women and all the rest of you in the class of 2019, congratulations, you did it, fantastic. Um, I know you have spent many long hours studying at Count Way and Sebastian's and late nights at Pudding Stone and the Mission and way too many meals I hear at the Squealing Pig, <laughs> correct? Um, but looking out at all of you, uh, I see people who have worked incredibly hard and learned so much and not all of it um, in the classroom. You've learned that if there is no campus organization dedicated to solving a problem that keeps you up at night, you might just be the one to start it. And that it's always a good idea to have a couple of evergreen po protest signs and keep them by the door of your apartment because you just never know when you might need to go out and march on short notice, correct? Uh, <laughs> and, and, but most importantly, that there's nothing more exhilarating than surrounding yourself with smart people who care. And many of you have overcome incredible adversity to be here today. Um, and this class brings enormous diversity into the public health care field at a time when we have never needed you more. You are so talented. You could have done anything with your lives, but you chose the path of most resistance. You chose to work in public health, and we are so grateful that you did. Yeah, give it up for this class. Um, so, and I mean, depending on when you started, you might not have thought that starting your career at Harvard meant you were going to be on the front lines of even just defending the whole value of public health, but in fact, that's now your job. Um, I think of it, this as the next installment of the Avengers franchise, only you're the Avengers, all right? Um, now, I had a really super upbeat set of remarks about the future. I'm going to get to that in a second. But um, it, coming down here yesterday, um, I, I just decided I couldn't leave her today without acknowledging this moment that, that we're in. Um, so I spent the last 12 years, as you heard, at Planned Parenthood. And even though we had our ups and downs, and we definitely had a lot of that, like most folks working in uh, healthcare, we really did operate under the assumption that forward progress is practically inevitable. We believe that improvements in science and research and technology means that we're gonna get even better at expanding access to healthcare and new ways to help more people live healthier lives. Um, although I even remember myself that just two years ago uh, at Planned Parenthood, we were simultaneously fighting to keep our doors open uh, because of the political threats of defunding in Congress, while at the same time, back in our clinics, uh, doing the clinical trials on a new, brand new, self-injectable birth control that got approved by the FDA, which is revolutionizing birth control access in America. Um, so I'm kind of accustomed to this idea that sometimes you take two steps forward and often take one step back. But yesterday, we learned that for the first time since the Roe versus Wade decision 46 years ago, an entire state is facing 
uh, the fact that they will likely no longer have access to safe and legal abortion. So yesterday it was announced that the state of Missouri, which the state of Missouri already has restrictions. Uh, I didn't order this guy. I don't know. Um, I mean, folks follow me everywhere to disrupt, but this is a new, this is a new, um, okay, we can do it. Um, so the state of Missouri already has restrictions that are so impossible to comply with that there was only one health center remaining that actually provided abortion services, and now the state's refusing to renew that health care license, which means that starting this weekend, barring a miracle, legal abortion will no longer be available in Missouri. Now, Missouri is a state of more than one million women of reproductive age. Let that sink in. This is 2019. And so today, despite all the progress we've made, despite the fact that abortion is one of the safest medical procedures in America, the country is about to take an enormous step backwards, not because of science, not because of medicine, but 100% because of politics. It's just a real, in real time reminder that the biggest hurdles you're gonna face, I believe, in getting people the health care they deserve will have a lot less to do with our public health care system and a lot more to do with our political system. So it's not just, it's just not enough anymore to be public health experts. You have to be advocates and you have to be truth tellers. So you're ready to do that? It's, it's important. Um, I mean, look, your jobs, your jobs just got harder and they became even more important because I think you really are uh, a class that's now gonna be on the front lines of moving this country forward to true health equity and access in America. So as you go off to travel the world or go back to work in the community that you come from, uh, or stay right here and help improve healthcare access in Boston, there are three things I think we need to do. First, if you wanna create change, you're gonna have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, okay? Now, I'm not talking about what happened at Planned Parenthood when we launched our Tumblr site and had to explain that no, our digital health team could not diagnose STIs based on photographs that folks sent in. Um, and in fact, we had to tell people, please quit sending um, these <laughs> photographs. Now, maybe one day we'll be able to do it. I, but I, um, I'm talking about standing up for people even when it's unpopular. So if you, as you may have heard, and not that this is a thematic, but unfortunately right now it is a thematic, uh, just two weeks ago there were 25 legislators in Alabama who voted to pass a law that would ban virtually all abortions in that state and could put doctors in jail um, for life. Now, the one thing that all of these legislators had in common, none of them will ever be pregnant because they are all men, okay? I think that's the ultimate legislation without representation. Um, so the legislation was signed into law by the governor and it lit a fire all across America. People from every walk of life, every political ideology, even political party spoke out against this law. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a person is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And so in the midst of what I would definitely uh, qualify as a challenging time, I cheered to see Dean Williams' pointed op-ed in the Boston Globe, all right? Um, she, she underscored the fact that these same lawmakers have also voted against access to birth control. They've refused to expand Medicaid, which actually pays for more than half of the births in Alabama a state that already ranks 50th in the nation for infant mortality. Now, you'd think that would be a good healthcare crisis for the state legislature to actually work on, right? Um, but Dean Williams summed it up perfectly when she wrote, when women don't control their own reproduction, they don't control their own health, their economic prospects, or their ability to reach their full potential. And by the way, that goes for all pregnant people because we know that it's not only women who need abortions, okay? And I think though, it's impossible to overstate the importance of people in the public health community standing up boldly with the people who are counting on you. So for those of you who believe, or for those who believe that public health, we have the luxury of staying out of politics, 
We simply don't. So welcome to the fight. Um, okay, the second thing we need to do is make sure that there are people in office who represent the diversity of this country because that's how public health um, makes progress. And listen, I learned this in my time at Planned Parenthood. If women aren't at the table, we're on the menu. That was true over and over again. One of my favorite examples was a Senate hearing back in 2011 when Congress was deciding what should be in the Affordable Care Act, what should be covered. Um, and a United States Senator from Arizona, who will go unnamed, said he didn't believe that insurance plans needed to cover maternity benefits because, quote, I'm never going to need it. I, I don't know, apparently he was past his childbearing years at that point. Um, <laughs> But at which point, Senator Debbie Stabenow turned from Michigan, turned right around and said, well, I bet your mother did. And it's important because we won that. And before the Affordable Care Act, only 12% of insurance plans cover maternity benefits. And now they all cover maternity benefits, which is why it matters who's in office. Um, and then I just, I can't leave you without re remembering another fabulous hearing when a male senator leaned over to his staffer and asked, why is it that all the funding for cervical cancer is only going to women? <laughs> I, I did not make that up. That is actually a true fact. Um, but that's why it's really exciting when people who really are public health experts uh, are in office. And one of them is Lauren Underwood, a 32-year-old RN from outside of Chicago. Now, last year, she was part of this wave of women and people of color who ran for office. She beat six men in her primary, and then she went on to beat the incumbent in November. And in January, she became the youngest African-American woman ever to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives. Yeah. So, but here's why it matters. Um, this spring, along with Congresswoman Alma Adams, she created the first ever Black Maternal Health Caucus to help change the appalling statistics when it comes to maternal mortality in America. As Lauren says, we have to start to tackle this issue and elevate it, elevate it as a problem that's worth solving. That's the difference it makes to have someone in office who has actually worked in the public health care system make public health care policy. And so, in addition to all the other good things you're going to do as graduates, I hope every single one of you is thinking about running for office, okay? All right, let's think about it, all right? Um, and third is, we need to build movements across race, across gender, sexual orientation, income, to fight for true health care equity in America. And that means using our privilege for good and speaking out when you just might be an unlikely ally. So as I've said, obviously, we are very near losing the right to safe and legal abortion in America. But what I wonder is why is it almost exclusively uh, women who carry this battle, right? Um, I mean, men have certainly been part of abortion decisions. And in fact, most pregnant people got there with a man's involvement. So wouldn't it be awesome if male leaders in public health schools across America joined Dean Williams and wrote their own op-eds? I think it's time. Because like all of public health issues, abortion isn't a women's issue. It's a fundamental issue of the right of people to make their own health care decisions. And that affects everyone. And even though I'm incredibly grateful that Congresswoman Underwood and Senator Kamala Harris and others are raising the alarm about the crisis of maternal mortality, but why does it always have to be African-American women who raise the alarm, right? Am I right? We all urgently, all of us, have to take on racism in this country, including and especially in our healthcare system. And so I was really actually encouraged to read that last week in Wisconsin, Milwaukee County declared racism to be a public health crisis as a way, exactly, as a way of finally not just looking at the data, but as a way of addressing decades of race-based inequality. County Executive Chris Abley said, local government needs to take a leadership role, and we intend to do so. And I hope other elected officials, especially white elected officials, will follow his example. Um, so, okay, we got work to do. So, as for me, since I left Planned Parenthood, I've joined with other women across the country, Alicia Garza, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, 
um, Ai Jen Pu, the leader of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, to create a new organization, as the dean said, supermajority, to build the most powerful multiracial intergenerational movement for gender equity possible. Because to me, building this kind of movement, it's more than a political goal, it's a public health imperative in the United States of America. Here at the Chan School, you know that disempowerment, whether it's political, economic, or social, has profound consequences for public health. We know that people who endure racism have higher rates of chronic disease. People who are financially insecure suffer deaths of despair caused by, caused by alcohol, drugs, or suicide. But when people are empowered and when they are trusted and listened to and have the right to make their own decisions about their lives, that can change everything. So I think it's time to do more than resist. It's time to imagine the country we want to live in and then go build it. So just imagine if our government devoted real resources and funding to solving the, the maternal mortality crisis. We can do that. Or imagine a Congress that had the courage to address the epidemic of gun violence, which is undeniably a public health crisis in America. Um, imagine, imagine if we made communities with clean air and water our priority from the Bronx to Los Angeles to Flint, Michigan. Imagine a government that cares about families and that recognizes when immigrant children are dying at the border, that is a national emergency. <laughs> and I like to imagine a future where we don't have to worry that our daughters or our sons will have fewer rights than we do. So even though it might seem like it right, it may not seem like it right now, I think we actually have all we need and what it takes to do all this and more. Here at Chan, I mean, you've studied the amazing, incredible public health victories in America from the near eradication of polio to the massive reductions in tobacco use. And back more than a century ago when Planned Parenthood first opened its doors, birth control uh, wasn't, wasn't even legal and the birth control pill hadn't be even been invented. But as the dean said, today birth control is covered under the Affordable Care Act for no copay and we're at this 30 year low for unintended pregnancy and a historic low for teen pregnancy and that is a public health success story. So I feel like all of you now are joining generations who came before you who believe that healthcare isn't a privilege, it's a basic human right. My mom, the late Governor Ann Richards, believed passionately in public service. And she used to say, you know, you can go, go somewhere else, you may make a lot of money, but you will, never have, you will never receive the kind of gratification that comes when someone looks you in the eye and says, thank you for making my life better. So class of 2019, congratulations. You are powerful, compassionate, you are ready to take on the world. So let's go do it. Thank you very much. So you have your marching orders. Thank you, Cecile. So I was going to save this quote from my favorite poet for the end of my speech, but something Cecile said makes me want to say it now. So uh, this month ma marks the fifth uh, anniversary of the passing of America's poet, Maya Angelou, one of my heroes. And as I was spending the long weekend walking around the Arboretum this weekend, I listened to a podcast that I hadn't listened to for quite some time, just for a source of inspiration, just to connect with my favorite American poet. And mid-stride, I heard a line that I have come to learn is a three-word secret to living your best life. Do you want to know what those three words are? Just do right. Yeah. 
those three simple words, I think, exemplify Cecile's entire career. Um, and I think it exemplifies and marks the journey that you're about to begin. So Maya Angelou said, just do right. Right may not be expedient. It may not be profitable, but it will satisfy your soul. Just do right, class of 2019. As is our tradition, we ask a representative of the school's alumni association to bring official greetings to you and to welcome our graduates to our alumni community. It is therefore my honor to introduce my friend, Rashad Massoud, president of the Harvard Chan School's Alumni Association. Rashad received his MPH in International Health from the school in 1993. He is a physician and a public health specialist who is internationally recognized for his leadership in global health care improvement. Rashad currently serves as director for the USAID Applying Science to Strengthen and Improve Systems Project. He is also Chief Medical and Quality Officer, as well as Senior Vice President of the Quality and Performance Institute at University Research Company. URC is an international organization that provides innovative, evidence-based solutions to health and social challenges worldwide. At URC, Rashad leads quality improvement efforts in more than 40 countries, applying improvement science to deliver better results in global health priority areas. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Rashad Massoud to the podium to deliver the alumni greeting. Thank you, Dean Williams. Graduates of the class of 2019, proud parents and families, honored guests, esteemed faculty and staff, honorable Dean Williams, and distinguished commencement speaker, Cecile Richards. As president of the Alumni Association, I'm honored to, to be here today and to formally welcome the 2019 graduates of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health as new members of our Alumni Association. Fellow alumni, I congratulate you on your achievements and salute you for your commitment to public health. What you have learned at the Harvard Chan School has equipped you with the knowledge and skills you will need to navigate the ever-evolving landscape of public health. The school has prepared you to continually learn and tackle the challenges that will come your way as you work to improve lives. The world needs you, needs all of your innovative thinking, your methods, your skills, and your leadership. Years ago, I stood in your place feeling armed with the best knowledge and skills ready to embark on a new and fascinating adventure. I had the confidence and the conviction to take on any challenge, and there were many. One of them was when I worked as a physician in a primary care setting. In this role, I received about 100 patients a day. The waiting times were long and frustration was high. Every physician in that system faced a similar workload. Equipped with the methods of data analysis, process redesign, and teamwork I had learned at the Harvard Chan School, I got to work solving the problem. I set up an improvement team. We started talking to patients and analyzing the reasons for their visits. The data showed us that some patients didn't really need to see a doctor. Many patients came for a lab referral or for a repeat prescription for an otherwise stable condition, and so on. 
we started to categorize the reasons for the patient's visit and to, to redesign the clinic process. We managed the categories one at a time, testing changes, monitoring the results, and instituting the changes that worked. Over time, we reduced the number of patient visits to a physician from about 100 to about 15 a day. Patients and staff were happy. Patients went out of their way to thank us for these changes. As you can imagine, I was very proud of this accomplishment. I wrote up the results. I provided the data to support the redesign. I sent the documentation to the system leadership and recommended scaling this up to all the health centers in the system. I eagerly awaited the response. When it came, it wasn't quite what I was hoping for. In fact, it was just the opposite. The leadership of the system instructed me to immediately return everything back to what it was before and told me that I should operate in accordance with the policies and procedures of the system. It was a huge, unexpected disappointment. Now, in parallel with this, and in a voluntary capacity, I also chaired the Harvard University Middle East and North Africa five-country program to introduce improvement methods to the region. This work attracted attention in the medical community beyond the health system I was working in. Shortly after the incident, I received and accepted an offer from, an emerge, from the Emerging Health Authority in Palestine to lead improvements in the country. I started to work at a scale way beyond one health center or even one health system. Several years and many improvements later, I joined the company and the project I am with today, working on improving healthcare globally. To date, I've contributed to improving healthcare in 102 countries. So why am I... <laughs> so why am I telling you this story? My message is simple. Never give up. I know the excitement and passion with which you are graduating. I know that each and every one of you will make a huge difference. But it may not be a walk in the park, and there may be obstacles, and you may encounter disappointments along the way. I certainly did. But do not let that take you off track or reduce your ambition. Never give up. Finally, as you graduate, you become an important member of our vibrant 14,000 strong global alumni network. You will find Harvard Chan School colleagues, peers, and mentors all over the world. This is a network of some of the world's most extraordinary public health scientists and practitioners. I invite you to join the Alumni Association's activities, committees, and councils as well, so you can become even more deeply involved in our global public health efforts. Your worldwide Harvard Chan community is waiting for you. Once again, congratulations. <laughs> and now, I'm pleased to introduce Michael Grusby, Acting Dean for Academic Affairs and Executive Dean for Administration, who will be presenting this year's Faculty and Staff Award. Thank you, Rashad. I have the distinct pleasure to announce this year's faculty and staff award winners whose work at the school has been recognized by their colleagues. As I announce each award recipient, I will ask them to stand in place briefly and be recognized. Please hold your applause until I have announced all of the faculty and staff award winners. The Harvard Chan Teaching and Mentoring Awards are based on student feedback through course evaluation questions that focus on quality of teaching and effectiveness in class for the teaching award, and through student nominations and committee vote for the mentoring award. 
I am pleased to announce the following faculty awards. The Roger L. Nichols Excellence in Teaching Award goes to Ichiro Kawachi, John L. Loeb and Francis Lehman Loeb, Professor of Social Epidemiology. Three teaching citations are awarded to Linda Kabulian, instructor in the Division of Policy Translation and Leadership Development, Margaret McConnell, Associate Professor of Global Health Economics, and Benjamin Summers, Professor of Health Policy and Economics. And this year, we are pleased to give three mentoring awards to Nancy Turnbull, Senior Associate Dean for Professional Education and Senior Lecturer on Health Policy, Joshua Gagne, Associate Professor in the Department of Epidemiology, and Jesse Bump, Lecturer on Global Health Policy and Executive Director of the Kakenmi Program. The Outstanding Teaching in Executive and Continuing Professional Education Awards go to Mary C. Finley, Lecturer on Health Policy and Management, and Lori S. Pascal, Lecturer on Health Policy and Management. The Sarah K. Wood Award was established by friends and admirers of Sarah K. Wood in tribute to her many years of exceptional service to Harvard University and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. It recognizes a staff member who demonstrates the qualities of dedication, competence, positive attitude, initiative, and ability to mentor, encourage, and inspire others, in addition to a demonstrated commitment to the school and its mission. I am personally very pleased to announce that this year the award goes to Katrina Soriano, Director of Administration and Finance in the Department of Nutrition and Interim Director of Administration in the Department of Genetics and Complex Diseases. The Staff Recognition Award was created by the Harvard Chan Student Association to ensure that members of the Harvard Chan community who are neither faculty nor students are acknowledged for their great efforts to help students at the school, specifically staff members who make a significant impact on the lives of students at the school. This award is intended to acknowledge the importance of non-classroom and mentoring activities on the lives of students. This year, we recognize two staff members, Allison Connery, Senior Education Coordinator in the Department of Global Health and Population, and Gary Williams, DRPH Program Administrator in the Office of Education. And finally, the Community Engagement Award was created by the Harvard Chan Student Association to recognize faculty, researchers, and staff who have served as a source of inspiration by demonstrating a commitment to improving health and well-being in the communities where they work. This year's winner is Esprin Austin, professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Now, please join me in applauding these outstanding faculty and staff. I would now wel like to welcome Aaron Driver Lynn, Dean for Education, to present the Harvard Chan Student Awards. The Harvard Chan Student Awards honor outstanding students through a selective process of uh, nomination and committee deliberations. Um, this year we recognize 18 students. I'm going to announce each of the awards and ask them to stand in place and be recognized. And again, uh, please hold your applause uh, till the end. The Albert Schweitzer Award goes to Leila Hazuni. The Dr. Fang Ching Sun Memorial Award goes to Christine McKellar Mitchell. The Edgar Haber Award in Biological Sciences goes to Nelson Knudsen. 
The Gareth M. Green Award for Excellence in Public Health goes to Lilek Kazatsyan, Shudit, Shudipta Saha, sorry, uh, and Noor Jial. The James H. War Ware Award for Achievement in the Practice of Public Health goes to Tiana Woodridge. The Robert B. Reed Prize for Excellence in Biostatistical Science goes to Alexandria Levis and Mole Liu. The Student Recognition Awards go to Jasmine Hall, <laughs> Jonathan Hill Rory, <laughs> Supriya Mistra, and Sunjana Sundare San. The Teaching Assistant Awards go to Gita Ayer, Cameron Pools, Koichiro Shiba, and Joy Shi. The Ui Brinkman Memorial Travel Award goes to Christine Tadi Yanto. Please join me in congratulating all of our award winners. <laughs> get to the, the main event, presenting the candidates for degrees, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the contribution of Stan Hudson to these ceremonies for the past 18 years. Stan served as the Associate Dean for Student Services from 2000 to 2014, and in that role, for an additional four years after his retirement, uh, Stan read the names of every graduate crossing this stage, honoring more than 8,000 graduates from nearly every country around the world. Please join me in thanking Stan for his many years of dedicated service <laughs> to our students. And taking over that role, it is now my pleasure to introduce Robin Glover, our new Associate Dean for Student Services, who will read the names of the doctoral degree candidates while the department chair robes the candidates. Just go ahead. Professor Brendan Manning will be hooding the following doctoral graduates from the program in Biological Sciences and Public Health. Allison Brooke Androsky. Corey Vincent Gerlach. <laughs> Maria Erica Elagan.
Kent Langston. Gabrielle Rango. Andrea Smidler. Pei Yan Tai. Professor John Quackenbush of the Department of Biostat Biostatistics will be hooding the following doctoral graduates from that department. Stephanie Folane Chan. Tom Chen. Leah Comment. Isabel Fulcher. <laughs> Jeremiah Zay Liu. <laughs> Carla Marquez Luna. Zachary Ryan McCall. <laughs> Abigail Sloan. <laughs> Jaffer Sadie. Professor Lisa Berkman of the Department of Population Health Sciences will be hooding the following do doctoral graduates from the department. Layla Ashar. Sarah Magoo. Samantha Malsbury. <laughs> Zihui Wang. <laughs> Professor Russ Hauer of the Department of Environmental Health will be hooding the following doctoral graduates from that department. Rand Schmel Rotem. Dilpreet Singh. <laughs> Yi Chen Kuo. <laughs> Zail Kanap Pony. Professor Albert Hoffman of the Department of Epidemiology will be hooding the following doctoral graduates from the department. Dale Aubrey Bonhart. John Gabrielle Conley. Issa Dahabre. <laughs> Eric Quinlan Moreland. <laughs> Yi Han Shu. Men Jung Wang.
Kazuki Yoshoda. Professor Marsha Castro of the Department of Global Health and Population will be hooding the following doctoral graduates from that department. <laughs> Yvette Yuluche Efebera. Aaron Kinsella James. <laughs> Joe Wei <Wei-Li>. Lee. <laughs> Ling Ru Leo. Danielle Nicole Poole. <laughs> Lee Sinderovich. <laughs> Jigasa Sharma. Professor Frank Hugh of the Department of Nutrition will be hooding the following doctoral graduates from that department. Marielle Avezu. Selma Jucevic. Ramadahani Abdallah Noor. And Andres Victor Artisan Korat. Edward Yu. Alvin Tran. <laughs> Professor David Williams of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences will be hooding the following doctoral graduates from that department. <laughs> Amiya Batia. Yulin Xuan. Matthew Kiang. Aisha McAdams Mahmoud. Supriya Misra. Christine McKellar Mitchell. Farah Qureshi. <laughs> Alina Shaknam Kimal. <laughs> Christine Lativia Simon. Catherine Paulin Smith. Yeah. 
Taylor Redeen Ash. Rick Segrist, director of the Doctor of Public Health program, will be hooding the following DRPH graduates. Nazman Bua. <laughs> Denison Doran. Elvis Jose Garcia Gonzalez. Marissa Solbinson Hen. Angela Caslow. Catherine Rachel Perry. <laughs> Caroline Ronoda Pogi. <laughs> Catherine Ann Robb. Gretchen started. <laughs> Kailechi Weze. <laughs> Kwanis Yorgaliv. Dakota Yashioka. <laughs> Candidates for the Master in Healthcare Management degree Thomas Anthony Aloya, <laughs> Chen He Chang, <laughs> Efron Dalla. Catherine Lynn Mezer Dietrich. Robert Alex Eldenstein. Blair Eggerty. Marcus Friedrich. Philip Goshasan, <laughs> Siddhartha Gangadharan, <laughs> David Bruce Granite, <laughs> Mark Brumley Juckett, <laughs> Richard Kaplan, <laughs> Manal Kapoor. Jason Anthony Kruger. Chandra Sekar Lingesetti. Danielle Ramos Madrill. Deborah Mahaley Soberman. Peter Moran. Yuri Rafael Nakasato. Victor Navarro. Harun Ismail Pertel. Kareen Dinesh Patel. 
Jazdeep Sidana. Jonathan Sonas. Candidates for the Master of Science in Biostatistics degree. Yael Flamad. Ian Chan Bay. Anti Bing. Danielle Eamon Briggs. Caroline Broadwell. Wenning Ding. Nathan Eli Hall. Rose Huang. Ming Ting Li. Chu Ying Ma. Carla Mahia. Hillary Miller. Shuhei Miyasaka. Yong Jung Park. <laughs> Wei Ping. Elizabeth Kathleen Welch. Kobe Lane Wilkinson. Tianu Shaw. Yui Yang. Eunice Shea. Candidates for the Master of Science, Computational Biology and Quantitative Genetics de degree. Marina Christy Ching. <laughs> Hong Kong Kim. <laughs> Anthony La Martina. <laughs> Ray Tong Lee. Reiko Nishihara Nakashima. <laughs> Dong Yan Song. <laughs> Yushi Tang. <laughs> Sequan Wang. <laughs> Zhu Tao Wang. Minru Shu. <laughs> Mingzi Yang. <laughs> Yanqi Yang. <laughs> Shihan Zhang. <laughs> Tong Jawao. Candidates for the Master of Science, Environmental Health degree. Yu Shan Chong. <laughs> Sifan Kuo. <laughs> Sojia Ma. <laughs> Zen Yi Cho. Matthew Schaefer. <laughs> Angela Shields. <laughs> Wei Yu Yao. <laughs> Jing Yuan. <laughs> Yuffie Yuan. Michael Zhao. Can, 
Candidates for the Master of Science Epidemiology, Rahima Banji. <laughs> Hannah Michelle Brower. <laughs> Catherine Ariane Bouchan. <laughs> Yi Yun Chen. <laughs> Taylor Chen. John Robert Cordes. <laughs> Edward Keith Duran. Alexa Nicole Elhurt. Christina Elizabeth Marie Fennell. Anthony Galonis. Yo Wen Gao. Jasmine Marie Hall. Rakuta Hamaya. Wei Ting Shu. I Ting Hong. Amita Garish Qatar. <laughs> Hannah Hae Yung Kim. <laughs> Brenna Lee Kirk. Shores Clop Maker. Sarah Lapidus. Waylin Lee. Egg Lee. Heather Margaret McKenzie. Alexandra Shireen Rashetti. <laughs> Jun Kwon Wren. <laughs> Stephanie Sibley. <laughs> Ray Song. <laughs> Sanjana Saint Deresan. Helen Tespe. Jana Wee. Ming Wang. Zafan Wang. Shall we you? Zen Wen Zhang. Cha Chu Zhao. Chi Heng Zhu. Candidates for the Master of Science, Global Health and Population degree. Shika Chandarana. <laughs> Melanie, Melanie Chitwood. Yadi Da. Ray Ding. Susan Brooks Gerzenda. Yashing Jia. Purvaja Kavator. Leland Kazayan. Paulina Lima Saleh. <laughs> Shudipta Saha. 
Cynthia Veronica Siego. Duriat Steen. Yu Chen Tsai. Nora Zanyo. Yi Yun Zhu. Master of Science, Health Data Science degree. Abjita Ashok. Jia Jing Chen. Christopher Helger. Jian Chang. Si Li. Yu Tang Liu. Yang Ying Chu. David Salen Sassen. Chen Shi. Jingjing Tang. Catherine Wang. Jonathan Yam. Jen Min Yu. Chi Zhang. Candidates for the Master of Science, Health Policy and Management. Sadia Sadiq Zada. <laughs> candidates, for, candidates for the Master of Science, Social and Behavioral Science, Martin Chien. <laughs> candidates for the Master of Public Health, Abukar Abioye. <laughs> Remy Abu Gaida. Ahmed Al Dal Fada. Ariel Abovich. Isaac Aqua. Sumit Agarwal. Emily Egger. Saman Ahmed. Jin Yoon An. Rukarat Akandi. Matolani Akanola. Ulusheyi Ankentorin. Layla Ala Oda. Kevin Alford. Hassan Adam Al Hassan. Emily Bergeron Allen. Mina Al Saraf Alo. Sonia Amu. Lorenzo Inez Bustillos. <laughs> Mele Ayaka Bellu. <laughs> Mayan Karanke. <laughs> John Barawande Aremu. Tertha Aurora. Awanlim Atanga McCormick. Mark Atia. Arun Nima Awale. 
Andrea Lynn Axtell, Abera Azuma, Ashley May Bach, Patrick Bachtiger, Ernest Joseph Bartholomew. Pallavi Basu, Raven Bachan, Benjamin Ian Bernard, Tamara Beatham, Lara Rose Batoya. Sali Bambare, Sarubi Bak, Tor Bering Sorensen, Fernando Binder, Rupshaw Biswa. Max Blumenthal, Nicole Bolick, Jonathan Paul Bonnet, Sarah Kemenair Borland, Kelly Alexis Butler. Emily Kaplan, Catherine Carr, Claudia Patricia Castillo Bonilla, Estivalis Castro, Vendiana Cervantes. Ladislav Servinka, Ashmi Chekavorthy, Karina Chapesky, Prangthip Charon Pong, Ming Chong Chow. Nayli Chavez, <laughs> Ya Wen Chen, Loretta Yuan Yi Chiang, <laughs> AP Chucharat, <laughs> Nicholas Chi. Shia Cho Three Isaac Chua Virginia Clavo Daphne Claremont Jocelyn Clogston Layla Koshan Rachel Walters Cohen, <laughs> Melissa Connor, <laughs> Keenan Patrick Courtney, <laughs> Marquel Craddock, <laughs> Andrew Crean, <laughs> Wilson Louise Da Costa. Dennis Gerard Dacaret Galliano, yeah. Emily Gail Damon, yeah. Dui Trong Duo, yeah. Miss Beth Twada, yeah. 
Arthur D. Garadel Turan. Shailen De Silva. Paula De Del Rey Poich. Francis Anthony De Michael. Sagor Dasai. Thomas Telfa Silase. I love you, Mom and Dad. Hey. Layla Fazuni. Jonathan Dunlap. Eloisa Jardim. Daniel Keith Ebner. Lauren Edmondson. Ahmed Hisham Al Sheikh. Andrew William Enslin. Mary Ecklauer. Robert Filler. Jennifer Fish. Magali Flores. Alyssa Nicole Fochi. Jonathan Seth Breedstadt. Rostev Kuda. <laughs> Kathleen Marie Gang. <laughs> Jonathan Garcia Ruiz. <laughs> Charlene Melody Gao. <laughs> Allison Lynn Gilbert. Alisa Glubach Gonzalez. Akash Goel. Ryan Gold. Daniel Alexander Gonzalez. Jose Luis Gonzalez. Ooh. Rosemary Roque Gordon. <laughs> Sandu Govindapali Lai. Alexandra Lynn, great singer. Shervanti Gumidilila. Cheryl Edim Pato. Peter Hagen. Laura Jane Hansen. Owen Harris. Sandra Harta Sanchez. Jumana Hashem. Takahito Hatano. Tesoro Hayashi. Laura Helen Heath. Chantel Ebear Maggie.
Elena Hernandez Martinez de la Pasquina. Clayton Burnett Hess. Jonathan Hill Rory. Samir Hirji. Caitlin Hogan. Johan Holmberg. Sangui Hong. Emily Paris Howell. Michelle Pye Howell. Ethan James Hughes. Evan Humphrey. Maya Illowite. Kayla Ennis. Maria Iqbal. Rachel Ann Isaacson. Sabina Jalal Khan. Isabel Jan May. Samir Jetkar. Bajin. Kayla Michelle Johnson. Natalie Penhill Johnson. Jennifer Aviva Jonas. Nathan Merritt Jones. Yechan Zhu. Aya Kagoda. Shilpa Kaluru. Emiko Kamitani. Vijay Kanan. Justin Allen Kaplan. Asuri Kachugampala. Jacob Katayan. Tayab Sami Khan. Rowit Kana. Lena Kulkarni. <laughs> Hassam Abdulatif Kurdi. Sohi Kwan. Shre Lakotia. Claire Marie Lamnack. Kathleen Ann Lane. <laughs> Fushuan Lee. Maya Kale. <laughs> Jessica Teresa Kilpatrick. Grace Une Kim. Elsie Kaujo. Satoshi Kimura. Kate Collars. Sarah Lynn Pacchiovili Kozer. Sh sh 
Shayna Lipa. Chun Han Lo. Mabel Shofan Lo. Andrea Luviano. Christopher Ma. Ratnaporn Mahatanan. Eileen Feinstein Mariano. Jillian Joan Lee. Susanna Woodward Lee. Jeannie Leesman. Sungmin Lim. Frank Yi Fu Lin. Miguel Angel Linares. Akhil Mehta. Anna Shalomit Miller. Yoon Hong Min. Dara Minovi. Anna Luisa Murto. Samir Masood. Camila Mate Matteo. Justin Conrad McCarty. Molly Elizabeth McGlone. Naraj Narula. Ahmed Abdul Hadi Harb Nasser. Dina Nathanson. Naomi Nenduga. Miriam Nimari Shafari. Mark Nicholas. Malshi Mohan. Sarah Mozau. Yui Sakitani. Kaiska Nagawago. Nirmala Priya Narla. Faisal Naji. Elizabeth Nolan. Mary Obasi. Anthony Terrence O'Brien Villetti. Brian Patrick Ogara. Maureen Ogia. Joy Oluwesian Ogunuria. Dahi O. Jessica O. Emika Okoni G. Kuber Ola Niran. Ronke Olawo J. Shiku. Henry Anyi Aka. Rebecca Molly Kessler Oran. Ryan Bradley Astacio Ortizo. 
Hu Wei Ling Pong. Michael Parento. Harman Parhar. Key Park. Olivia Song Park. Jennifer Janelle Parker. Christina Paychette. Mary Elizabeth Paler. Mariana Pereira Gimarez. Alexander William Peters. Jordan Pida. Dr. Armand Quaymar. Frank Chien. Clayton John Rabins. Vishika Ragavir. Lakshmi Ramachandran. Kaylee Wolf Raskin. Rohan Rostogi. Ravathi, Ravathi Ravi. Kaylin Reddy. Glacilera Reyes Giovannini. Lena Roa. Courtney Ann Robinson. Angel Rosario. Megan Kathleen Rossini. Paula Roy, Paula Roy Berman. Catherine Lee Ruffing. Sama Sabetti. Anna Mika Saha. Michelle Savuto. Mohammed Salem. Christopher Scheiber. Ensa Marie Schmitz. Jeanette Schneerly. Samir Koshik Shaw. Vidor Sharma. Raphael Sherak. Nancy Shillian. Subarna Shrestha. Tracy Segrist. Dana Marie Sievers. Ajit Singh. Shubhi Singh. Jennifer Sittig. Jennifer Sue. Tamar Subramani and <laughs> Yang Sang Sa <laughs> Louise Sumner Aral Sermeli <laughs> 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 
Melissa Sutton. Wendy Jo Svetnikov. Tang Min Sui. Mai Takahashi. Ayako Takiyami. Kena Takio Oshima. Vita Tambone. Francis Tao. And Darcy Elizabeth Taylor. And Wa Teriyaki. Silone Tip. Giovanni Mahesh Thakur Garcia. Abhaya Taweri. Nisha Trevedi. Grace Truong. Ingrid Say. Saja Chanel Tubbs. Ryo Yushimoto. Gabriella Vargas. Shriam Venkitaranam. Roberto Vidri. Heather Michelle Viola. Nita Varoni. Monica Vora. Amanda Elizabeth Waller. Nancy Wang. Stephen Wang. Yang Wang. Catherine Weinberg. Arlen Weiner. Katrina Louise Welch. Rachel Clara Wooten. Brianne Wilhite. Amanda Wu. Tiana Simone Wooldridge. Devin Thomas Worcester. Allison Wu. Jimmy Wu Rowe. Brian Allen Wiley. Allison Yang. Hannah Margaret Yi. Noyam Yosefi. Bao John. Marianne Zhang. Ting Zhang. Vivian Zhang. Charlie Dazu. Marcella Joe Wong.
Does anybody question the physical fitness of a dean? Now I'd like to ask all of our graduates to please stand. Harvard graduates, Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health 2019 graduates, this moment marks your entry into the company of learned women and men and the beginning of your life as graduates of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. May your paths be filled with wonder and joy and satisfaction as you use your talents and education to improve the lives and make the world a healthier and more just place. I have no doubt at all that each of you will find your own way of making the impossible possible. Congratulations to you all and best wishes for your journey ahead. Don't forget Dr. Maya Angelou's three words for living your best life. Just do right. Please join me, please join me in a rousing chair to congratulate our graduates.